What's up guys, Drew here. Thanks so much for stopping by and checking out this episode of The Edge, where Brad and I sit down with our good friend, Bill Picard. Now in this episode, we get into everything from old school connectivity to business continuity and data center trends across the globe and specifically in Data Center Alley. Now Bill's experience in this industry is extensive and we get into a lot of good stuff in this episode, so you're not gonna wanna miss any of it. So don't forget to like, subscribe, and sign up for notifications so that you don't miss out on any future content that we drop on our channel. So now let's jump in to the interview. Welcome everybody to The Edge, a TMG Corp production. I'm Drew Knoll. And I'm Brad Furnish. And today we have a very special guest with us, Mr. Bill Picard. Bill is the Global Vice President of Business Development for Integra Mission Critical, a leading data center design build firm. He started his 20-year internet career with one of the original backbone providers, Digex, back when a T1 connection was considered high speed. Later, he joined Equinix at its inception, spending 11 years with them in multiple sales roles. He later worked with Raging Wire, Byte Grid, and eventually Cyrus One, as they all expanded into the Northern Virginia area. Most recently, with the Seaman Company, Bill led the charge of working directly with hyperscalers on the data center infrastructure requirements. Bill, we're happy to have you. Thanks, man, for being here. Hey guys, thank you. Um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity and miss working with you guys day in and day out. So glad to be here. Thanks. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Bill, one of the things that we ask all of our guests on the show as a bit of an icebreaker uh, is okay. if you would briefly describe uh, maybe the most unexpected event in your career, uh, whether it was a positive event or a character building moment, uh, just some little nugget about uh, your career that, that was really unexpected out of left field. Uh, wow. Okay. Um, so it's 19, it's 99. It's 1999. And I was at Digex. And like I said, I was, Digex had a, had a, had a hosting side and it had a connectivity side. And I was on high speed connectivity. My boss left, said, Hey, I'm going to call you in a couple of weeks. Let me get landed where I'm going. I'm going to this company called Equinix. And, uh, okay. And he said, I'll give you a call. Why don't you come over and check it out? So I get the call. It's just before Thanksgiving. And I go to what turns out to be Equinix's very first data center. And it's, it's in the middle of a, of a, of a row of buildings. It's a, it's a warehouse complex and they, they've got the middle one third. It's all of 50,000 square feet. Well, that whole complex now is the uh, original Equinix campus in Northern Virginia, but they started small. And you walk up and there was no signage because their whole thing was, you know, we don't want anyone to know who we are and where we are that doesn't need to know. Okay. Um, so I'm walking around and all I find is this box that I have to open up a door and there's a thing for me to put my hand on. I have no idea what this is or a button to push for security. Push the button, talk to somebody through a speaker, doors open and I go in. Okay. And so now I talk to this guy behind bulletproof glass and I, and I have to hand him my driver's license. Security guard comes out because I'm like, okay, now, now I got to have a security guard with me. And he now opens up a man trap. I've never been in a man trap. I, I, I don't know data centers. We go into the first stage of the man trap, door closes behind you. Then the next one opens, you know, picture uh, the old get smart. If you remember that. Uh, yeah. And I walk into the lobby for the first time of the very first Equinix data center the lights down environment. They got their, their red silo that was, they were known for. And, and this big conference room and sitting behind the conference table is Pete Ferris. Pete Ferris was their legendary VP of sales, later chief revenue officer and, and retired as their chief evangelist. Great title. And, and the data center's lights down and is behind it and all that. And I go into interview with him. My old boss, John Hardy is there and, and, and for it. I'm talking with him for a while. And, um, and you can't not look around. And they did this on purpose. We would have our meetings and you'd always have the customer looking out onto the data hall floor behind you. And I wrapped up that meeting uh, after talking to Pete and I got a laugh out of him, thank God, because I looked at him and I said, Pete, I really have no idea what all of this does, but I know I can sell it. And he loved it. <laughs> and that's, nice. that's his history. That's awesome. That's, that is awesome. Yeah, for sure. So obviously, Bill, you mentioned that, you know, you've been in the data center for 
a long time, 1999, you didn't even know what it was. But since then, you know, in the last 20 plus years, there's been a lot of things that have changed. You know, there's been some economic booms, there's been some busts, you know, there's been, you know, some national tragedies along the way. So I just kind of want to get your your take and given your, especially in data center alley and have, you know, been in Virginia the entire time, you know, what has the evolution of data centers been like, you know, basically through that last 20 years to now, but then also, you know, secondarily, you know, what are some of those cool trends or what were supposed to be cool trends that might have fizzled out? Well, that's a lot. Um, so let me take it in, in chunks. And if I miss something, pull me back to it. Um, you know, yeah, we definitely have seen a lot change here. Um, if you come into Data Center Alley today, come in off of Route 28 and you go over this big flyover into Ashburn and you're now on Wax Pool. Uh, road and you're heading straight into data center alley. But as you use, as you come over that, uh, that, uh, that flyover into, in Ashburn, there's a whole huge campus of buildings and they all say Raytheon. But 20 years ago, they all said AOL and slowly all of those names, AOL signs have come down and Raytheon has taken over that whole campus. And if you've been here through all of it, it's kind of sad. Um, because what started all of this here in Northern Virginia, in Loudoun County, was Ashburn, I'm sorry, was, was AOL, was the original UUNet backbone, which I competed against was selling for Digex, and then ultimately Equinix coming in to build. Uh, and there were all kinds of incentives from Loudoun County to get everybody to come out here. Later on, uh, several years into it, Buddy Riser, everybody knows about, knows Buddy Riser uh, as, as running Loudoun County economic development and really shepherding data centers. He came in several years later and really helped drive the efforts. But we've seen these these changes, um, starting with just those three. But Equinix changed everything. Equinix was this first pioneer to do an, a, a truly network neutral data center in the U.S. You had that already in Europe and, and in Asia. But in the U.S., the data center activity was typically owned by a network provider. Equinix was building these cement boxes with lots of cooling and lots of backup power, but we needed to attract in the UUNets and at the, at the time, Genuities and, and uh, all these other back, backbones that are pretty much gone now, but inclusive of Sprint and AT&T, uh, we had to attract them in because we didn't have a backbone story. We wanted everyone to come here to be able to get to this ubiquitous uh, ability to, to interconnect across platforms. And then all the other data centers started coming in, your DRTs, your DuPonts, all these other companies. And they started building around Equinix because they could then tether in, buy some, buy some capacity, some dark fiber from a Summit IG or back in the, back in the day, uh, Zayo and, and all those guys, and tether into that connectivity story. Um, so the big change really, I, I would say that I've seen is, is the way that Equinix revolutionized and built the, the, the way that data centers have expanded around the U S, uh, and then over time internationally. Um, now you mentioned tragedies, um, you mentioned big events, none bigger than nine 11. Um, and it was, you know, obviously it was just a, an awful time. And I was at Equinix and I remember being in my office and somebody said, Hey, a plane flew into the world trade center. I'm thinking somebody had an accident with a small plane or whatever and realized everything that was going on. You guys might not know this, but in tower one, uh, one world trade centers, uh, floors 101 through 105 was the corporate headquarters of probably the biggest bond trading firm, Cantor Fitzgerald. And they were pretty much wiped out when that building came down as a company. Um, that company and many others uh, survived and got and became, if you will, resurrected out of all this mess by companies like Equinix and other data center providers. In our data centers, they all got started again and rebuilt by working on six foot banquet tables that we rented from local places and just gave them capacity, gave them found folding chairs and gave them a place to start trading again and start doing their business again, you know, and from there, lots of companies that, that do major DR presences for, especially for the financial commi uh, uh, community really blossom. But that, that tragedy of nine 11 and the, the myriad ways it impacted our country and our world 
was amazing to see the impact uh, to the data center community and, 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 and really, well, the way that the data center community helped rebuild uh, a lot of communities that it touched. That's awesome. I didn't even know that. That that's that's awesome. I'm glad you got to be a part of. Obviously, it's not cool to be a part of that tragedy, but helping rebuild and helping some of those companies stay afloat and get back to where they're going. I mean, that's that's a lot. And obviously, we're gonna see some of that similarly to the 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 stage that we're in now. Um, so, well, and think about it. When we were all at Cyrus, they acquired Servalis, and Servalis had buildings where they just rented out DR rooms and facilities that were you know full of computers and printers and everything but nobody worked out of them but they were there just for that what if scenario and that all started uh, sadly from 9-11 or maybe didn't start from that but was truly driven in its importance that's for sure okay yeah that makes sense so additionally you know moving moving on a little bit you know there's been lots of trends and lots of big buzzwords and we have you know some that have popped up in the last few years but i'm I'm curious in the last 20 years, you know, especially, you know, through the early 2000s, what are, you know, a few of those big buzzword trends that, you know, might have actually hit and became huge, but more importantly, like what were, you know, if you remember off the top of your head, some of the things that were supposed to be the next big coming in the data center world or the technology world that just kind of fell flat on their face and don't really exist anymore. Uh, Wow. Um, Okay. That's... Wow, that's that's tough. You know, <laughs> you know what? I'm going to answer both questions. I think with the same word, and it's cloud. Okay. Because the cloud, the idea of the cloud and outsourcing your produ- production, whether it's you know whether it's DR, whether it's production, whatever it is, has come in fits and starts throughout my whole career. If you think about it, back when we were telnetting into mainframes, you guys are young, you never did that, but I did, uh, you know, that, that was all early cloud adoption. That was all putting the compute somewhere else and having your, your lap, your laptop, your, your terminal, your, your desktop, more or less a dumb terminal. Um, there were fit. So, uh, above net, one of the original data center providers, um, uh, colo.com, another one that, 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 that didn't make it. They all embraced early on significant amounts of managed services. And there were waves throughout the industry, throughout these 20 years where it was big to have a lot of services. And then there was a time, you know, and, and Equinix really was, was big on this for years. No, 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 we're not going to have any services. We want the service companies to come in and sell their services within our data center. So you, we've seen this kind of fits and uh, starts and stops, I guess is what I'm trying to say, of cloud adoption and cloud development over the years. Um, There was times when, you know, everybody thought, nope, we're just going to run Colo and everybody does their own thing. And then it started to come back. And and really with the advent of the term cloud, um, the whole idea of, of software as a service or platforms as a service really took shape in a format uh, and I think driven greatly by the greater amount of capacity that's available now uh, on, on dark fiber and across networks to really make it work uh, logically and, and, and really take shape and, and firmly, you know, to not go away. But the, the idea of cloud really came and went at several times throughout the last 20 years in different names and different, uh, you know, styles and, and delivery methods. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, Bill, you know, and, and I'd like for you to kind of hit a little bit of what you guys specifically do at Integra, because I think it's, it's, it's important to the, to my next question, I think is, what are you seeing to your point? I mean, the, the whole concept of cloud has transitioned from its inception to where we are today. And, you know, we even are still seeing that it's a very fluid and nebulous term in terms of how, you know, every business defines cloud for them differently, whether it's full cloud, hybrid cloud, this on-prem cloud, like the, you know, the Amazon Outpost and the Azure Stacks and those kinds of things, or uh, technologies where people are bringing the quote-unquote cloud on-prem. And I know from, you know, where where you're at now, you're, you're more on that build side or the project design side. Are you seeing companies or organizations or even industries as a whole adopting more of the, we're going to build our own cloud in different areas. I mean, obviously the, the big cloud players are still going strong. So people are still leveraging them, but do you have a sense in terms of where different industries 
in their size, you know, enterprise versus hyperscalers, wholesalers, where, where is the cloud from a build standpoint going? What are they doing with it? I think it's, believe it or not, it's really, it's so truly in its early stages. I mean, we, you know, you hear people talk about, use the analogy of innings. We're still in the bottom of the first or whatever. Um, we're seeing across various industries and, and government as its own separate entity, various levels of cloud adoption. Um, and what's, what, what's really facilitating it is the development of the software defined network platform, the SDNs, companies like Megaport, companies like Packet Fabric that are developing these on ramps within that can be deployed within data centers because the data centers are realizing that traditional colo isn't going to happen forever. It's not, it's, it's, that's not what it's going to be. Cloud is becoming more and more prevalent. I believe there will always be a place for your own co-location for your own gear, your own intellectual property, whatever it might be defined by your industry, whether it's HIPAA compliance or whatever it might be to have your own, but there's more and more moving to the cloud. And that's, it, depending on the industry, really defines how quickly it's happening. Uh, the, the commercial sector, the s- smaller enterprise sector, if you will, are the ones that are really embracing it and really taking the chances, but they're driving it through, cl- uh, through SDNs. So you can be in an Equinix, you can be in a Raging Wire, you can be in anybody's data center, you can have a beautiful colo uh, deployment, you might have 20 racks, you might have 100, you might have multiple sites. And you don't have to just pick everything up and move it all to the cloud and write off all this gear that isn't ready to be written off. Now you can do it over time. You can test the waters. You can take a port uh, through one of these SDNs. You can, with them, you can move uh, process, processes and, and projects across different platforms on an as-need basis. Um, so that's driving it, and that's going to be continue, I think, to be the on-ramp that keeps that moving forward across different sectors. Yeah, no, that's that's perfect. And, uh, you know, I I wholeheartedly agree with you in terms of the SDN piece. I mean, you know, prior between my stint at Cyrus and here at TMG, I was at Megaport for about four months, um, you know, right selling, selling Megaport. Uh, and, and, and you're right. I mean, the enablement, I believe that, that what's driving – or what's what's precipitating the the drive in cloud adoption is is those enabling types of technologies because the cloud for a lot of people it isn't as easy as plugging in a port right or or you know right. they don't they don't know how to you know unless you you're robust enough to know how to configure and build in those APIs with the big cloud guys um, you know, having those systems engineers and those process engineers, it, it makes that a, as it makes it a more difficult process to move into the cloud, right? And and then it's the whole, uh, you know, it's been advertised so much, you know, the cost aversion to cloud, right? It, it's we all, I mean, as being data center sales guys, right? We used to be, hey, you can put your data in the cloud, but getting it out is going to be really expensive, so you should buy some data center space from us, right? Um, and I think from what I've seen in my experience, very short experience at Megaport. Um, those types, you know, Megaport, Packet Fabric, those guys, they're they're bridging that gap and they're making it a much more uh, simple process as well as what we saw, what I saw at Megaport was a lot of the enterprise services guys um, that used to have an issue with, you know, you'd have these managed service companies in these little pops, um, but they were very regional because they didn't have the distribution to get national and global, right? But those one of the things that those Megaport and Packet, and I'm not trying to make this a Megaport or Packet commercial, but one of the things that they do, that what the SDN really, and that's what those guys are, uh, any of those SDN platforms, what it does is it allows them, it, 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 it adds reach for those those organizations, right? And it the, they're enabling people's adoption to cloud, which ultimately, as cloud gets bigger, um, you know, to your point, you know, the cloud 20 years ago was a mainframe that you had a, you know, a dummy uh, console into now the cloud is all of the web-based stuff that we're doing because the web has right. grown, you know, but the cloud is just somebody else's compute somewhere. It, it's city, it's, it's, it's bare metal somewhere. It's just, do you own it? You lease it, you know, yeah. or, or manage a service on it, but it, it, it's all the same thing. And it's driving as, as cloud gets bigger, data centers have to get bigger. Now the traditional colo model may change. Right. And that's right. to your point. That's what we're seeing. Right. And that's what we're um, seeing. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but no, that's, that's a really interesting point. I, I, uh, I, 
the cloud, if I'm hearing what you're saying, the cloud is really driving the whole thing because it's, it's coloring the market in terms of what people are consuming, right? More people are consuming more, more cloud. Um, but then there's also, there's less, I don't know, I would be interested if you, if you have some insight into is enterprise building less traditional co or consuming less. Yes, it is. It is. When I talk to my colleagues who are still uh, in the leasing sector, you you see what you see the most of, at least in what I'm what I what I understand is you see obviously obviously big hyperscale takedowns. Their hyperscalers are building, but they're also leasing. Um, you know, to a hyperscaler, very often going to a Cyrus or an Equinix or a DRT, that's their edge node. Uh, believe it or not, even though it's probably a couple you know, megawatts, it, but it, to them, that's an edge node. Um, so you're seeing continued uh, a sustaining of, of demand on the hyperscale side. You're also seeing companies that, that are, that are your old, more traditional managed services, the guys that were, that, that will even develop your website for that startup customer, that company that's just now pulling whatever their presence is, whatever their compute is out of that closet in their office that has a, you know, a stack of paper holding the door open because if it closes, everything overheats and, and shuts down, they're starting, they're, 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 they, they still exist and they're still important. So there's the companies that have those services. Uh, a great one in our area is Data Canopy. They take down footprints with the raging wires now NTT and Cyrus ones to to be to take on those smaller customers, while Cyrus and others and all want to focus on the big hyperscale takedowns. Their you know their REITs that's how they drive their values and drive their business. And that middle that enterprise that commercial market that's where you see, from my experience and what I'm reading, the greatest amount of cloud adoption and this whole hybrid cloud approach. I've got a cage here. Maybe I don't need all 100 racks. Maybe I now, but but the but the the company that's hosting them or co-locating them, I should say, doesn't want to lose the revenue, so they can now transition that revenue into cloud on ramps or uh, spreading their footprint over multiple data centers, but still keeping the revenue intact. Uh, and, and that's where we're seeing the, the the biggest adoption and the biggest change. Awesome. And Bill, to that point, I know we've talked a little bit about cloud, and you mentioned edge a little bit there, and you know you're obviously in the construction and project services side of things. You know, a few years ago, there was a big emphasis on co-location from, you know, let's consolidate our data centers. You know, I don't want 20, 50 data centers, whether that be a traditional colo enterprise or, you know, you reference the closet, you know, being held up by, you know, the door open with some paper. So with that being said, you know, we know that some folks are still a little anti-cloud, even though, you know, they don't really have much of a choice. But mm-hmm. from a building perspective, are you seeing a reversal in that consolidation, almost a deconsolidation of people wanting their physical environments? Indeed, indeed. And that is, and that really speaks to, that's a great word for what we were just talking about. This deconsolidation. Yeah, maybe they had this big footprint here in Northern Virginia. Now they realize, you know what, I, I do have an, a, a, a an application or, or a project that, that we should try it out on the cloud. So they do that. And then they realize, you know, we really should have a footprint in another weather zone. So Dallas or Chicago or whatever it may be. But yeah, deconsolidation is a great word that, that, that's, that is happening along with hybrid cloud deployments. They're happening together um, and, and they're changing the way data centers attack their business, how they staff their teams and, and how they go after the market. Awesome. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that we're, we're seeing that too. And, you know, that kind of leads into the next topic of, you know, when we've hit on a little bit of edge, you know, what is edge and depending on, you know, who's talking and what definition you're looking at, or, you know, just like cloud, some people have their own definitions of cloud. You know, I'm curious as to, you know, what is your definition of edge? What is, you know, the definition that you've heard from some of your different customers? And then, you know, frankly, strategies to go ahead and deploy it or the best way to deploy it or some things that you've heard through your experience. Well, you know, it, it's funny. Uh, when I was with the Siemen company and we were doing infrastructure, we're talking cabling, we're talking uh, power strips and, and, and all the things that go into the white space. Um, 
we wanted to get to the edge. We wanted to be impactful on the edge. And the reality is the edge, and, and we started to hit on it a few moments ago, has so many different definitions. You know, there's the definition of the edge, again, for, for the big hyperscalers, that might be a hundred cabinet or a megawatt takedown somewhere. Whereas to companies like Vapor.io or Edge Micro, they're pioneering small deployments sitting at the base of cell towers and deploying throughout metros in small markets and all kinds of companies in between. What's interesting though, is all of these companies, edge to full large scale data centers, they all have similar needs, maybe just in different scale. And what we're seeing is an ever growing need for density. Everything's running hotter. Everything needs more power, more compute in a small box in a small area and they need, they need flexibility. They need to be able to scale it up and scale it back down on demand. Um, we're also seeing things like a demand for building times and building cost to go way down. And, and so that's kind of where companies like mine, Integra Mission Critical come in. And, and I see quite frankly, where TMG Corp become really important for the edge, but really for all of it. So if you look at an Integra, we're utilizing a manufacturing approach to building data centers. And what I mean by that is while we're tilting up the walls, whether it's precast, whether it's a tilt up construction, whatever it might be, depending on the region and what makes the most best sense, we're also simultaneously building out the mechanical and the cooling infrastructure in, in a manufacturing environment, in a separate environment, and it is trucked in and attached to the building. Well, what does that do? It allows us to build greater densities into the building. Because if we're putting up a, this, this square box, let's call it, as a shell, now we can glean so much more of that white of that building as white space, and we can build it out more densely because we're not giving up space internally to a mechanical infrastructure, to the electrical rooms. We're attaching it on the outside. We're building all of that at the same time, and we're taking months out of the of the of the uh, of the whole timeline and we're lowering costs significantly. So these kinds of things are impactful to the edge as well as everywhere. And then I look at things like, like you guys at TMG core and we, and as I mentioned, ever growing density is so important, especially out at the edge. What you guys are doing with auto and with immersion in general is allowing such incredible density to become a plug and play in, in, a, in a plug and play module of fashion, if you will. And so the ability to scale and grow is, is exponentially improved. I'm thinking that eventually we'll be building data centers that really just focus on the electrical and, and, and the building itself, because we're not going to need to do much with cooling because you guys have that coupled with the co-location and the compute all in what you're doing with immersion cooling and it's changing everything. And that plays all the way down to the edge. You know, you look at vapor IO, you look at edge micro, I mentioned those two in particular, they're doing some amazing things. Vapor IO, they like to talk about managing the middle mile. What does that mean? It means that they're managing content as it comes off these cell towers and helping distribute it and get it, get it to do whatever it is it needs to do without taking it all back to the main data center for processing. Edge Micro is changing the way the internet peers. Their peering happens in the data centers, it happens primarily in Equinix data centers, but in other spots or in peering points all around the world. They're taking peering into these little edge facilities, sitting at the edge of, a, at the end of a cell tower or adjacent to uh, a Verizon CO. And now they're making routing decisions across the internet right there in this small box in something that, that, that could be run by an immersion unit like, like yours. And all of that is taking latency out of the internet and making everything that we want to do with IOT, everything like driving cars eventually without anybody in them and keeping them within the lines, all of that compute could happen. We're taking out more latency because of what's happening with these guys. And this is happening at the edge. Uh, and it's, it's just, it's amazing what's growing every day. I went down a lot of different areas just now. Forgive no, me. no, that's, that's awesome. And, I, and that's where uh, my head is, uh, you know, there, there's a lot to process there. Uh, but I think, you know, the point that, that you made that's, that's, interesting to me is this technology innovation curve, right? It's the, uh, what, I mean, in my short stint in the data center, you know, five years, the, what we saw 
Colo building evolved from and to, and it still is evolving. And to your point, like what you guys are doing at Integra in terms of how you're building out um, your facilities and, and increasing or decreasing your lead times and increasing your savings to your end user, right? The, this whole push out to the edge is causing this innovation of technology because it has to, right? That's, that's what, you know, we keep hearing um, as people are coming through our building and, uh, and, and the conversations that we're engaged with is that what we have now is, is, has a very minimal shelf life or, or, you know, lifespan in terms of its efficacy, right? Cause that's, Right now with where the tech market's going, it's all about how quick I get my return, right? And, and how quickly can I monetize my asset, right? Well, you can't really, when you're talking about net net, you can't monetize your asset until you paid the thing off, right? And so um, in, in, in true, you know, when we're talking about returns. And so, you know, it's it's been a really interesting thing to see how all of these different technologies are really pushing the envelope and pushing the adoption or the innovation curve. Um, what for us has been interesting, and I'd, I'd love to hear your opinion on it, is how that adoption curve is lagging behind the innovation curve. I think there's a lot of people doing a lot of really cool things out there, um, but what we're seeing is the adoption of those really cool technologies uh, that are being developed is is lagging. And we have our thoughts on why that is and how we generate that adoption. I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on there's all this really cool tech. How do we evangelize, not us as TMG or even Integra, but just in general, because we believe that these new technologies, they're greener, they're cleaner, they're more sustainable. So from, you know, maintaining what we have, um, you know, these things can be helpful or, or just from a cost effective standpoint, right? How do we get, how do we get people to adopt them? How do we get people to get, Hey, this is what we need to do. How, you know, I'd love your thoughts on that. And the, the answer is time, but, but, but there's, it's time coupled with a lot of things. There's t- it's time coupled with awareness and it's time coupled with need. You know, there's been so many different innovations around how to cool the data center. You know, we, we, some companies want raised floor, some want it on slab, you know, do, do you like, cold aisle containment, do you like hot aisle containment? Do you want in-row cooling? Do you want a cooling system mounted onto your onto your cabinet? And, and all these different things. And now uh, immersion as well. And immersion has been around for a while, but people haven't jumped all over it because it's messy. Because the idea of water on the data center floor, water whatever, or coolant, whatever that is, all of the, these impactful things that were anathema early on because you just don't do that. But now we've got all these other factors. Time, time has been, has allowed everyone to see how these things can work. Time has also made everyone see that the green data center isn't just something we want to aspire to. It's vital. So if you can do these things as, as time goes and innovation keeps coming out and, and it tries and it tries and it, it catches on a bit and then it kind of doesn't. But now we've got, we've got, economic factors, we've got uh, environmental factors, people start to open up their eyes. It's kind of like changing someone's religion. It it doesn't happen quickly. It it, it doesn't. And it it, it takes time to really dip your toe in, pardon the the, the pun there with with immersion cooling, but but it does. And now there's such a need for this densification of the data center, as well as an environmental stewardship. So how do you get there? You open up your eyes and you become more and more accepting of these new, what seem like outlandish opportunities early on that actually really make phenomenal sense. I think quite frankly, immersion cooling and you guys in particular with it being dual stage are going to take off and really drive the next stage of data centers and and the density within which that we will all be building and deploying. Thank you for that. You know, I, I agree with you there. Um, obviously, I'm at TMG, but you know, I think another another piece of it, you know, to your point, is is change is tough. You know, like from a psychological perspective, we we like the status quo. You know, as human beings, we like the status quo. And you know, for a lot of these technologies, we're kind of hitting that kind of fun breaking point of what status quo versus the information that I want now. You know, it's it's amazing how your user experience as a consumer when you go to 
a store, go to Amazon, you know, .com, you want the fastest experience, you know, you want the most predictive experience of like, nobody wants to get on their, you know, Amazon prime account and, you know, go looking for something to get suggestions on, you know, something that's polar opposite or nothing that you're into. Like you want to have that personalized experience and that's from a consumer side, but then, you know, from a, from a business side, you mentioned it and touched on it earlier of, you know, being able to process compute right where you are, you know, turn it around, spin it up and use that information there. So we're kind of, in my opinion, reaching that breaking point of here's what has worked. Here's what I'm comfortable with, but here's the demands that I have, or here's the demands that are being placed on me, you know, as a business to business provider, a business to consumer provider where, you know, there are also adding, as you mentioned, the greener pieces and, you know, nobody wants to see, you know, acres upon acres upon acres of data center space being taken up or driving down, you know, the road and seeing five straight miles of just this big warehouse looking thing where unless you're in the data center world, people don't know what it is. Then we think they're really attractive. Right, exactly. Um, you know, but then also as mentioning to the edge of, you know, you talk about how many people sit in some of these, you know, cities, you know, the populations are so dense, there's not space to build those big data centers. So we're kind of, we're reaching that point where, you know, we can continue to do the way things have always done, but we're reaching some of those issues of it doesn't get me the information that I want and I want it yesterday. You know, it's amazing how, you know, when you look at some of the hospitality environments that, you know, some of their ratings are actually just driven and dictated by, you know, they didn't predict what a consumer wanted or, you know, by the time I thought of it and you already prepared it for me, all of a sudden I have this great, amazing experience and now I'm happy. So, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting, you know, obviously, you know, we have our opinions on how things work, but to the point, you know, to your point, time is, is the master of all things and we have to be cognizant of it. But to me, I'm very interested to see how things are driven out um, you know, based on what works, what will work and the evolution of technologies to, to meet that demand. You know, change is very disruptive. We know this. Um, and there seems to be certain points in, in the timeline around the internet and around data centers collectively and separately where change and that disruption is, is warranted and it's ready Mm -hmm. to go back to the Equinix uh, mentioned earlier, Equinix fundamentally changed the way the internet operates. They changed the way the major backbone providers peer and exchange traffic, creating what we know as the internet. And that was hard. When we first started telling that story in 99 and 2000, we went and met with the big guys and we had crickets. Uh, and then finally it took uh, later on, they did the same thing with the financial industry with what they call their FX platform with, with trading platforms. They, they brought all of the, uh, these big trading platforms, black box, uh, you know, high frequency, low latency trading platforms on their sites, taking out more latency, changing fundamentally the way that worked. At Integra, we like to feel that we're fundamentally changing the way the data center market is being built and being deployed and being thought about. Uh, it's more effective. It's more cost efficient. It's faster. It takes time. Uh, it takes that. It, it bridges that gap between the large capital expenditure and revenue generation for the operator, and changes the, the way uh, under generally accepted accounting or GAAP principles the way the whole building is depreciated. All of that is vital. And now there's this new disruption in 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 this need for. Uh, density, 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 that I think immersion is the, it, we've seen so many different things. We've seen the in-row coolings. We've seen all these different approaches at how can we, you know, cool this one row that's running too hot or how can we angle this air just right? I think you guys are poised for this, this, this point of disruption that is vital for our continued growth. Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate that. And then obviously we agree. I, you know, the one point I was going to make in terms of we were talking about change, you know, Carl Rogers said that people change when the pain of staying the same is greater than the fear of changing, right? And doing something different. Um, and, and obviously that's, that's very much a psychological approach. However, it, it's true of human nature and it's true of industries as well, right? And that's, to your point, that's what we're seeing as, as people need data 
quicker, more robustly processed, um, you know, when, when it needs to be in multiple places more than once. Um, and, and all of those things, we, yes, it may be scary to adopt some of these new things. You're right. It, it, it's disruptive, you know, at, at our, as a, at a physiological level, our, every cell in our body is created to, to, to stay the same. It's that, that concept of homeostasis. Uh, however, um, sometimes staying the same is detrimental. And that's what we're seeing, you know, from a business standpoint is, is you know, everything is being driven. We, we are such a, an experiential driven society, right? It's all about how I feel. Um, and all of these businesses are so driven. And it's not just hospitality. That's probably the most prime example because it is such an experience driven industry. But I mean, when you sure. think about it, you sure. think about anything, think about your internet, right? You know, like, I mean, we're, you know, we're now doing these things uh, remotely via these web platforms because, you know, we can't be in the studio to do them. And, you know, Brad and I have spent countless hours trying to get all this stuff, you know, we've had, whether it's a connectivity issue or it's a bandwidth issue, you know, so even your internet is such an experience, your consumer grade internet is such a, an experience driven thing. And, and, you know, Brad and I were actually having a conversation about this this morning, that, that your experience is driven wholly and solely by data. You know, I, I have to, for me to craft the right experience for you, um, I've got to have the right data sets and how we manipulate and, and transit that data. Um, you know, there's only two ways that we improve data uh, processing and transit, right? It's a bigger pipe or we reduce proximity. That's the only way, right? Um, and, and the you know, the pipes, you know, from your experience at Equinix, it, it's not cheap to lay fiber. Um, and the bigger, you know, and the bigger the fiber, the more expensive it is, right? So when you talk about cost efficacy, laying bigger pipes isn't the most business sense option, right? So then you're left with the other, which is proximity, which, uh, you know, obviously we believe that that's why we're starting to see all of these innovative technologies and getting, pushing the edge and beyond the edge and all, and, and the edge being redefined um, because we've got to get the data closer to people, closer to the end users, closer to the processors and those kinds of things. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating to see how, um, you know, coming from my background in psychology uh, and, and then moving into sales and, and technology, there's such a, there's such a meshing there in terms of how people consume technology and how the technology industry has pivoted and is, is changing and evolving, um, throughout the years. It's, it's so much driven by that human experience. Um, and, and it's, it, to me, it's fast. I love it. That, that's one of the things that, that excites me. It's why I love what we're doing here with this podcast. Cause we get to talk to lots of different people and their perspectives on, right. uh, you right. know, how they're, how they're seeing all of that evolve and, and, and technology is, you know, JD, our CEO hates the word, you know, revolution because we're not re- revolting against anything. We're evolving. Um, you know, technology yeah. isn't yeah. a revolution. Uh, it's an evolution because as, you know, as we, understand our needs better, um, we we then develop what we need to meet those needs. And that's evolution, right? You know, when you just look at the definition of evolution, it's I have a need, whether it's adaptation or whatever, and now I'm changing what I have to meet what I need or what I want for that matter. You know, when you speak of evolution and you mentioned briefly, you know, bandwidth and, and, and it, it was mentioned in my intro back in the day when I first got started, you know, if you sold somebody or at least somebody a T1, that was a great deal. You did most of your quota for the month right there. And if you lease somebody a 45 meg DS3, <laughs> wow, you are, you are just king of the world. Cause that was three to five months worth of quota or big time accelerators. Now everything's gigabit. It's, it, you know, I'm here in Ashburn and there is never uh, a road that, that, doesn't have more fiber being trenched. There are more miles of fiber in the Northern Virginia area alone than if you add up miles of fiber across the U.S. and in many other markets globally. It's insane. Wow. I did not uh, know that. Totally that's crazy. <laughs> oh, the, 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 some of the statistics are just mind blowing. You know, they talk about uh, 80% or more of the internet's traffic goes through Ashburn something a lot of people don't know is that statistic initially was completely made up. Um, <laughs> it was, but, but, but it is true. So, and, and, and it was made up at Equinix because think about it. Equinix was carrier neutral. We weren't operating the network. We weren't operating UUNX network or anybody else's network that was in the facility, but we knew they were coming in to do their, 
their private peering directly, as well as when we deployed the, the Equinix uh, peering switch, public peering as well. So yeah, you start to do some research and you get to know this, but initially we didn't know because we weren't driving or owning any of the network. But the reality is that the vast majority of the internet's traffic doesn't just come through Ashburn. It comes through one specific building on the Equinix campus. That is the most important peering point and exchange point, at least in the U S. Um, and all of that happens on miles and miles of fiber. Um, back in the day we, we had to wait, we, we were delayed a year in actually bringing all the fiber to that Equinix campus that we needed because we had to figure out all the uh, approvals to trench under uh, a small Creek that you guys, I know have driven over with me any number of times when we've gone to Ford's fish shack for lunch, when you were in town, that is considered a Chesapeake Bay, uh, tributary. And, uh, but, but now it just happens. It, but back then it, it took a full year to navigate that. Wow. That's <laughs> Man, that is incredible. So, you know, we, we've spent some time in evolution and trends and edge. So from your business and what you're seeing, cause obviously I know you, you were traveling globally and working on globally, you know, global projects, you know, and now we're all stuck at home, you know, what has that looked like from your business Has some business picked up as some of it slowed down, you know, and then also kind of what do you expect, you know, the next coming months, obviously nobody has a crystal ball, but just, you know, curious to get your thoughts there. The data center industry has been so fortunate. You know, you think about 9-11, you think about um, 2008 and, and the, the, the downturn then, and, and now with the downturn that so many businesses and, and countries are, are seeing with this whole coronavirus, it's awful. Data centers have remained fairly bulletproof through all of this. Sure, there's ups and downs. There is absolutely no doubt. But right now, the data center uh, uh, absorption rate is huge. Um, the major hyperscalers, uh, it, as well as enterprise takedowns, are all looking at, at what they had forecast for two, three, even five years out and seeing that they need it now. Because everything's changed. Think about it. You guys are working from home. If you, if you think about it now, I was talking to my neighbor the other night. He was talking about how he was watching a movie and for the first time it started to get choppy and things. We are seeing an impact on our networks, uh, on all of our uh, applications, on everything that we're doing that, that wasn't built, the, the internet wasn't initially designed or thought for. So, so much is changing, but so much of that means in the data center world, we're seeing adoption, we're seeing, we're seeing bandwidth takedowns also that are just, beyond what anybody experienced expected and, and forecast for because of this change in demand. Um, so we're seeing data centers filling. Um, therefore we're seeing opportunities to build data centers, uh, to support the, the, uh, the expansion, the growth, the, uh, optimization of, the, of existing data centers. Um, it's actually a busy time. Um, but you know, Unfortunately, it had to come at the expense of what we're all dealing with. But but the data center world is thriving. Are there any specific there projects, any specific that, projects uh, that, uh, that you're working on at Integra that, that, uh, that, I don't know, that you feel like are interesting, like cool, interesting or, cool, or, you know, or, that you, you know, just that you want to share about? Want to share about? <laughs> well, you know, we're seeing, a, uh, we're seeing significant growth internationally, you know. Uh, I don't want to say that, that, that the U.S. has the story baked because, you know, there's always growth. There's there's tier two, tier three markets. There's the edge developing and all that. But we're seeing more and more activity internationally. You look at countries like uh, India. Mumbai is becoming one of the biggest hotspots for data center development because of data sovereignty. So they have to have the infrastructure there. Um, and you're seeing that, especially in, in, in a lot of the developing worlds and, and where data sovereignty is a big thing. You're seeing all of a sudden a focus uh, of development in these areas. Um, and it's challenging. I mean, you know, if, if you're developing data centers in a market that don't have the most stable electrical grid, that's different than building a data center in Chicago <laughs> or in Hillsborough where it's 
two cents a kilowatt hour and there's plenty of it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, for, for sure. sure. No, that's, for sure. yeah, that's a, you make yeah, a solid a, point there in terms of, and I don't, I don't even think we know at this point, but I think the data center market is, is going to, or the data centers are going to change as a result of this, because, um, you know, where people are building data centers, where they want their data stored and even what a data center looks like as a, you know, we, we've talked about it. I think we've hit it on every single one of our, our episodes since the whole COVID thing, um, you know, uh, outbreak, you know, outbreak it is, it is what, technology what technology readiness and readiness preparedness, and preparedness looks, like looks like moving forward, moving from, here forward from here is going to be very different, very different um, than, than what it was than, before. Than it was you know, before. To, your point, to your point, I don't think point, any, I don't think any or, many businesses or many businesses had the thought of, we need to have a contingency to where every single one of our employees is not in the building. building You know, there was, there was the disaster contingencies of, okay, if there's a hurricane and we're shut down for X number of days, this is what we do, or a tornado or some sort of a natural disaster or even, uh, you know, active shooters. And there's that type of disaster preparedness and readiness. No one, and nor could we ever have foreseen what this looks like now. But if we're smart, and I believe that most people are, uh, uh, that we will moving we forward, will moving there will, forward, there will be a, there, there will be a, a pandemic, pandemic work from home, work from part, home of part of everyone's DR and, DR and be, you know, business, business continuity, continuity, all of that. All and that's of gotta that, be a part moving forward. forward. And, and, and the, you and, know, and all of that's, you know, all of that's driving data centers driving as well, data because how well, you, you know, to your point, it's, it's such, it's a, it's such a bandwidth heavy proposition, um, that I'll be interested to see if the guys that are providing that bandwidth, how their growth takes off, um, or even is now and then is now in the future as, as we prepare, you know, get out of this, but I, I hope that everyone's sentiment is, let's not just forget let's about, it, just when forget about done, it when it's right? done, let's, right? Let's, let's make sure that we're ready sure for something like that. Hopefully this, hopefully this never happens this again, never God, happens forbid. God forbid. Um, um, but, but I think that preparation think that will preparation absolutely play a part in the way the data and the data center industry and market evolves over the next six, 18 months. You know, and speaking of evolving, think about this. Back when I was a kid, Zoom was a kid's television show. Now it's how we have happy hour. <laughs> yeah, it is. I came here to Integra. I had never used Zoom before. It was this new platform. And now it's everything. And it speaks to what's happening and this evolution being drawn on by some of these terrible situations that we're going through. Um, now, and so that whole remapping of IP traffic more to the residents than ever before. Um, and these, these uh, cloud-based applications, these, the Zooms uh, from, you know, your work day, your, all, all of the different things that we use, all of it need more bandwidth because they are, you know, now they're more, more required uh, in this cloud environment and, and deployment uh, than ever before. I never thought I'd be looking forward to my next Zoom conference, but I've got one tonight, I think at 6.30 with some of my fraternity brothers. So that's gonna be great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. yeah I know that. That yeah, know yeah that, you, that, you hit it on the head. It's it's, it's, it's we're redefining what, what social connection social looks like, or just connection in, like, in general. Just connection you know, in general. It, it, you and, know uh, and uh, again, from my again, background, from my and, background and, you know, in you uh, know sociology and sociology psychology that psychology. that's really that, that's and, really, and, and <laughs> probably doing too much probably introspection too much on myself introspection throughout, this throughout this experience but, this experience, but, it, but it's very it's very it's fascinating, it's fascinating how, how what once was to your point to your you know point, something that we you know, just used we just as used as almost something almost we had to you, you know, nobody liked you know, getting nobody on conference getting calls. On nobody conference. liked nobody getting on, getting on, you know, web conferencing you know, web and all that kind of thing. It was, it was a forced, yeah. all right, we got a guy who's right, you know, in another state and we got to have him on the call. Fine. Fine. You know, Johnny, get on, we'll lap you in, whatever. And now to your point, we look, you know, when we started, my evolution through this process even was, you know, we started getting on these things. I was no camera, just the phone, you know, like, I don't even do that. And then about a week or two, and I was like, guys, can we please turn on our cameras? Like, I want to see some faces, you know, and like, you look, you know, what was connection and met that need 
uh, has significantly uh, has changed. Significantly now, I changed. hope now, that I that's, hope not, that the that's not the norm uh, in terms of, uh, and, and I know for me it won't be. I mean, my extroverted soul is dying a slow death, but, you know, what I do think would be really interesting in pulling forward is that I know I will, and I'm hopeful that the rest of society will. We can leverage these technologies to have conversations with people um, that we, we may never have had before. You know, the, we've, people have adopted, the, you know, the, the acceleration of adoption with these types of technologies throughout this experience has been immense. You know, you got, you know, we talked about it um, a couple of weeks ago on one of our other episodes. You know, you've got teachers who... You know they were doing you know, good to use an online grade book. Uh, now right. they're now, now they're, they're now admitting they're and, admitting and, 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 hosting and hosting calls with calls twenty with first graders, which graders, God bless them God for that. Them but for um, that. you know they're, they're adopting, adopting technologies that, that they never would have before, would and, have and, before and, and and other industries and sectors are doing the same thing because we don't have a choice. You have to continue to do business. You have to continue to teach kids. As a human being, you have to continue to have just social interaction and connection. And when you can't. Do, yeah, that do that safely through, safely our, through traditional our traditional means. means. Um, uh, we've we've been forced to we've adopt it, and I think people think will people are now starting to see the benefit of it, and and, 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 and I'm and hopeful that that will. I think we're gonna we're gonna do business in a lot of different and new ways than than what we did before, and for our better and for our better. Yeah, and to that point, I'm I'm also curious, you know, because we talked about you know, how data centers are being driven to be greener, you know, and smaller and some of those footprints, but with this technology adoption and obviously the increase in, in usage of these platforms, I know that there's gotta be, you know, some big companies out there that are actually doing feasibility studies on, you know, do we move to a complete remote workforce? You know, you talk about some of these large, you know, corporations that are taking up massive buildings and yeah, they're skyscrapers. So, you know, the, the square footage on soil is not necessarily the greatest and they build up instead of out, but you know, the cost of building. And then you look at, you know, Bill mentioned the electrical grid stability in India, you know, like, is it better to have everybody in one location in a big building or is it better, you know, to have a complete remote workforce? So for me, I'm, I'm curious about how all of these things come together. And, you know, I know that, you know, we've all been, you know, part, we all have our own opinions of, you know, I'd rather be in the office. I'd rather work from home or, you know, wherever. And, you know, we've all had to travel and, and do our business there, but I'm curious from, you know, a lot of, I'm curious to see from a lot of the business leadership perspective, you know, how some of those opinions changed of, you know, did, you know, we all used to work for you know, somebody who was very much a, you be in the office person. Um, you know, we've also worked for people who are very much like, I could care less if you're in the office, you need to be out in front of customers. Cause if you're not in front of customers, you're not doing anything. You know, I'm curious to see if some of those opinions have changed, you know, through all this and then what that leads from a, a build out and how we actually see corporate, you know, offices and corporate locations being developed and how they're run, you know, in the future. I think I think the change and in, in the adoption is going to be significant. You know, if you take a look at, and I'm, I'm digressing a little bit from workforce, but Google is now mapping their compute needs and the uh, how essential a certain type of compute is considered, and mapping those activities to when they can run it on only green power from wind turbines or from or from water or whatever. They're actually adopting or adapting how they process workflows from more essential to less essential to different times of day, different weather situations and, and actually uh, doing the compute, if that's the right terminology, in the right area to utilize green where they can. Similarly, we're going to see that just with our workforces. Uh, so many companies are realizing, wow, I don't need to see all these people all the time. But I think there's also going to be plenty of companies that realize, though, that the interpersonal interaction is fairly vital. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think it's going to be a very interesting line. And, you know, I know that, you know, I guess Drew and I get thrown into the millennial category, but I know a lot of millennials like that flexibility to, to go in and go out. So I'm just kind of curious at how this will increase that adoption for, for that flexibility in the workspace. 
So what am I? Am I Gen X? Is that what I am? <laughs> I don't know. I don't like to be classified as millennial. <laughs> oh my God, I'm I feel like I'm an old soul for that one. Absolutely. I'm a millennial in age. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm much older in my soul for sure. <laughs> Whatever I am, I, I tell you what, my dad got up in the morning and he went to work. And then in the evening he came home from work. So hence I'm still in the office. And like I said, I do have all the social distancing I want because I've got it to myself. But, uh, but yeah, I, I'm never going to be a work from home guy. You, you guys know that from when we all work together. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm a, a hybrid, hybrid guy. guy. <laughs> you do. Okay, good. Look at that. I like to go in a little. I like to work at home a little. Uh, yeah, I know Brad's not leaving the, the house if he doesn't have to. So. To me, I enjoy, I enjoy seeing the people. I enjoy going to the office. You know, it, it sometimes, you know, reduces emails, reduces, you know, phone call or phone calls and meetings, you know, those pick up at home. But, you know, for me, it's also some of those where I can turn off you know, my connectivity to the work, work workforce if I have to get stuff done. You know, whereas, you know, for me, it eliminates, you know, the fly by your desk and be like, you know, hey, how are you? You know, can you do this, this, and this? Whereas it allows me to prioritize some of that stuff. But at the same time, you know, there are some things and important questions that you need to have answered that having the ability to go into the office and having real-time access to the people that you need information from is definitely a positive. But sure. you know, for... For my, you know, career, obviously, you know, playing baseball and living on planes and buses and then transitioning into the work world, you know, I, you can give me a laptop and I can go to work from anywhere. So I'm good. Yeah, I get it. Sure. I get it. So Bill, if, uh, if our listeners are interested in connecting with you um, on social media or whatever other platforms and the work that you're doing at Integra, uh, how can they find you? Well, thanks. I would I would really like to connect with with everyone. Uh, B Picard at Integra MC.com is the email. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. If you do a search on Bill Picard, I'm not sure if there's several of us, but I'm the one in a purple hockey jersey holding up my first trophy. Uh, and I think I was 38, 39 years old at that point. And I was pretty excited. So, uh, nice. you know, a lot of people want to have that professional headshot. But I tell you what, everybody who see, goes to my site says, knows it's me because I'm, I'm in my hockey uniform. Uh, so I'm on LinkedIn. I'd like to connect with everyone and everyone um, uh, definitely want to share the story about uh, Integra Mission Critical and, uh, and look forward to sharing and hearing more of the story of TMG Corps as you guys continue to grow. Well, thanks, Bill. I appreciate that. I know that I speak for all of us, you know, Drew and I here on the edge and then all of us at Team G Core, we appreciate your time. And obviously it's great catching up and, you know, sharing some history with us that, you know, haven't been in the data center world as long as you have, but, you know, we'll obviously be in touch and, you know, I have to have you again on again soon. And you just called me old, but that's okay. <laughs> you should be used to it by now. <laughs> I look forward to seeing you guys finally when we actually can get together. And yeah, we need to go to the fish for lunch again. It's been a while. We got a lot of things we need to do. I need to get to a baseball game with you, and we all need to get some hockey in. And yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. For sure. For sure. Awesome. Well, that's going to do it for us here today on The Edge. Uh, don't forget to subscribe anywhere you pick up your favorite podcast and leave us a five star review. You can also find us at www.theedgetmgcore.com. Thanks so much. We'll catch you next time. And remember, the edge will go as far as you take it. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, guys. Hey, guys, Drew here again. Now, wasn't that an awesome episode? Now, if you want to make sure you don't miss out on any future content that we're putting out here on the channel, like, subscribe, and sign up for notifications. Then you can head on over to our other social channels like LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook and follow us there. You can also check out these really cool videos of some stuff that we've done in the past and you will be in the know on what we're doing here at TMG Core. Now from all of us here at TMG Core and The Edge, stay safe, stay well, and we'll see you next time.